10. All right, we're good. Okay, so chili was good, huh? Good, glad to hear it. Great prayer time tonight, you guys. Always blessed when we get to do that. We got one more uh, Wednesday in this month, so be here. be here or face the consequences. <laughs> Taking names. Yeah, we're going to publish it online. Who? Tomorrow? Well, happy birthday, young man. Going to be 33 again or? 49. Okay, good. Well, I was feeling about 99 a little while ago, but I'm thinking back down to 69 now, so that's pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. Okay, guys, let's pray. Let's get started here. It is late. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for these awesome people and their love and just their desire to serve you, um, to be a family. Thank you, Lord, that we're not playing church, Lord, that, that we're not religious, that we're just people that want to love you and serve you and love one another and we thank you for uh, the blessings that you give to us and the provision that you make for us lord tonight as we continue our study in kings um, father if we could if we can glean some spiritual encouragement from these things lord we would ask holy spirit that you would be the one to show us and we ask it in jesus name amen so we've got some construction getting ready to take place here. Um, you've probably seen pictures, I'm sure, over the years um, of what they thought the temple looked like. Uh, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, and of course, all, a lot of those photos or drawings or whatever, illustrations, um, they tried to take them from the text here that we're going to be reading and, and kind of build a model of what they read in, in the Word. Uh, sitting here together reading through it, that, that is a very difficult thing to do. But um, we're going to go through that. I think uh, all the numbers and all the names and all the stuff that we're going to be encountering in the next few weeks, I know it's really important because it's the Word. It's part of the Word of God. I know that each name and each uh, piece that went into building the temple, it all has significance. It's all really, uh, and basically it all points to Jesus. That's the whole purpose of the temple. It's to point to the Lord, to point to God's plan for, for the human race. So um, let's go ahead and let's get started in chapter 5 and verse 1. I'm going to be reading from um, this uh, Charles Spurgeon Bible. It's a little bit uh, clearer when it comes to numbers and measurements, so I thought it might be easy for us to digest as we're going down through here. So let's pick it up in verse 1. It says, uh, King Hiram of Tyre sent his emissaries to Solomon when he heard that he had been anointed king in his father's place. For Hiram had always been friends with David. Solomon sent this message to Hiram. You know my father David was not able to build a temple for the name of the Lord is God. This was because of the warfare all around him until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. The Lord, my God, excuse me, page turn, <laughs> There we go. Has given me rest on every side. There is no enemy or crisis. So I plan to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God. According to what the Lord promised my father David. I will put your son on your throne in your place. And he will build the temple for my name. So he's sending a message to this king who is way up north, um, 
Tyre, Sidon, Lebanon, those areas up in the northern Israel area on the coast uh, was ruled by this man who was obviously an ally of David during David's reign. And um, there's an interesting thing here that Solomon is coming to the conclusion, I suppose, um, that his father wasn't able to build the temple because of all the war, because of all the bloodshed, because of all the violence that was taking place uh, during that time. And it's amazing to me when we look at this in a sense that David was the perfect man for that job. Solomon wouldn't have been the perfect man for that job. Solomon didn't have a warrior's heart. Solomon was a perfect man for the job that he is about to undertake. He was a great statesman. Um, he made lots of good treaties. There was a uh, good economy, if you will. Um, the spiritual health of the nation was pretty good. Uh, it was a time of rest and a time of peace. And so it's amazing how God's timing tends to just kind of flow. You know what I mean? David had his destiny, I suppose, as a warrior. And he subdued the enemies of the Lord. Um, and the, there's a statement made here in this translation that really thought, I thought was very cool. Um, in verse 3, he says, this was because of the warfare all around him until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. Now, that's a statement that we read again in the Word. It's a promise that, you know, the enemies of God will be put under the feet of Jesus until he has destroyed all of his enemies and, had, and, and that time of peace is uh, ushered in. So we see a picture of that here, or if you will, a shadow of that um, happening here in Solomon's life. And so he's reaching out to Tyre because, uh, to the king here, because uh, he has some great resources. Some of the resources that he had is lumber for the most part. So in verse 6 it says, therefore, this is his request, command that cedars from Lebanon be cut down for me. My servants will be with your servants, and I will pay your servants wages according to whatever you say. For you know that not a man among us knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. So these folks had a reputation uh, for uh, lumberjacks. Yeah, I like that. Um, and he knew that. So was he a prideful man, Solomon? Well, we know as time goes by, pride kind of gets the best of Solomon in a lot of areas of his life. But this really shows great humility here to acknowledge the fact that we don't have the kind of craftsman that we need to accomplish this task, but we know that you do. You're, you're famous. You're, you're, your cedars are world famous for their quality and beauty. And, and uh, so I'll send my guys up to work with your guys, but your guys are going to be the ones in charge because they're the ones that uh, cut timber uh, in such a uh, perfect way. So when, Siren, when Hiram, or excuse me, when Hiram heard Solomon's words, he rejoiced greatly. And he said, Blessed be the Lord today. He has given David a wise son to be over this great people. And then Hiram sent a reply to Solomon, saying, I have heard your message. I will do everything you want regarding the cedar and the cypress timber. My servants will bring the logs down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will make them into rafts to go by sea to the place you indicate. I will break them apart there, and you can take them away. You then can meet my needs by providing my household with food. So they got a really nice um, agreement going on here. Interesting to me that they're moving all of this lumber by sea. 
They're, they're building these great barges out of these timbers and floating them down uh, to the place that Solomon would ask them to drop them off for them. And then they disassemble these rafts, if you will, and, uh, and begin construction on them. Now, one of the things we're going to see here that's amazing is that at the building site where the temple is going to be built, there were no hammers, there were no saws, there were no nail pounding going on. No, it, was, it was a silent construction, if you will, because all the parts and all the pieces had been assembled in a different place. All the stones were all cut in a different place at a quarry, and each one of them was marked as to where it would be set. Now, you know, uh, and some of you have been over there actually, but we know even from pictures that we've seen that, that uh, some of those stones are still in place over there today. You look at them and you think, my goodness, how were they even able to not just quarry these things, but move them some 30 miles to the building site. And then when you get to the building site, there is not a bunch of racket going on. There's no jackhammering. There's no pounding. Everything just slides right into place. It's a beautiful thing. Even the foundation, the, uh, the, the Temple Mount, even sitting there today, you can see the giant stones that were used to... Uh, construct that area right there where the temple would be placed. So Hiram, in verse 10, um, he provides Solomon with all the cedar and cypress timber that he wanted. And so Solomon provided Hiram with 100,000 bushels of wheat for food for his household and 110,000 gallons of oil from crushed olives. And Solomon did this for Hiram every uh, year after year. Every year, <laughs> 100,000 bushels of wheat and 10,000 gallons of olive oil. And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon. And the two of them made a treaty. So it's interesting how they arranged this um, building of this uh, bringing supplies down. When you look in verse 13, it says King Solomon drafted uh, forced laborers from Israel. And the labor force numbered 30,000 men. He sent 10,000 of them to Lebanon each month in shifts. One month they were in Lebanon, two months they were at home. Pretty brilliant, right? Pretty brilliant. One month they were in Lebanon working, and two months they were at home. Um, he never demanded the Israelites would toil in the mountains and the quarries for years and years at a time. Uh, because these men had their own fields, their own farms, their own crops that they needed to be taken care of too. They had their own homes that they needed to take care of. So, you know, you, you look at this, first we ought to be... Uh, of course, rendering service to the Lord. That's what he's called us to do. We are called to um, assist in building up a spiritual temple, if you will. But, you know, we all have to be careful to overlook, uh, not to overlook, our own household, too. Our own business at home. Um, you know, I've, I've seen that over the years, many... <coughs> pastors, if you will, and ministry workers get so uh, deep into their work that they begin to neglect their marriages or their families or their duties at home. A lot of pastors' marriages fail because of that reason. Some of them are great pastors. Um, some of them have had great successful ministries. But, you know, we looked at David and we saw his fatherly fathering skills weren't that great that he was so immersed in battle in war that he tended to not be very interested in the you know the up 
upbringing of his kids. So that was a fault that David uh, had. Yeah, we want to serve, um, but you can burn people out. That's a big concern for me here, even here in our little church, is that we have so many great faithful people that are always working. And you want other people to come and help and relieve them and give them a break once in a while. It's hard to do that um, without mandating it, without telling people you have to do this or you have to. And, you know, we don't want to do that either. We want people to serve God out of the goodness of their heart. So here, basically, maybe we have what we're looking at here is the Martha Mary scenario, right? You know, one of them was totally concerned with, you know, the work. And the other one was concerned with sitting at Jesus' feet. There's got to be a balance in our lives. It's good to serve the Lord. But it's also good to have time at home and uh, time to reflect and time to spend time with God. So he sends these people in shifts to uh, alleviate burnout. You want to serve the Lord with gladness, right? You want to serve the Lord with joy. You want, you're one of these workers, one of these 10,000 guys that are out there working. You want to no, I'm helping build the house of the Lord. This is an honor. This is a really cool thing that I get to be involved in. But they're only human. And you can burn them out. You can use them up. Solomon's wisdom is being shown here by how he coordinates these shifts of workers. So they were one month in Lebanon, two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the forced labor. Solomon had 70,000 porters and 80,000, look at that, 80,000 stone cutters in the mountains. Not including his 3,300 deputies in charge of the work. They supervised the people who were doing the work. And so the king commanded them to quarry large, costly stones to lay the foundation of the temple with dressed stones, which we can still see today. And so Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders, along with the Gebelites, quarried the stone and prepared the timber and the stone for the temple's construction. So we have this beautiful picture here of them uh, quarrying these costly stones to lay as the foundation for the building itself. And, um, of course, as I said earlier, a lot of this work was done away from the building site. And, uh, but the king took care to make sure that the quality of the work uh, was up to par by having these uh, supervisors, if you will, who kind of kept their eyes on these uh, thousands and thousands, 70,000, 80,000 stone cutters. Amazing to think about the, the uh, massiveness of this project that was going on. Um, of course, the foundation, you can't just use any stone. It's got to be a hard stone. It's got to be something that is able to stand up under the weight of the construction that's going to be on it and something that's going to um, survive the test of time also. Uh, and that's a, uh, a great witness of what we can see over there even of the ruins that are still there today. So chapter 6 starts off with Solomon beginning to build the temple for the Lord. In the 408th year, after the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt. In the fourth year of his reign over Israel, in the month of Ziph, which is the second month, the temple that King Solomon built for the Lord was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. So those are the dimensions of the building itself. I think you would look at that maybe today and think, wow, it's not very big. Only 90 feet long. 
That's really not a humongous building. The portico in front of the temple sanctuary was 30 feet long, extending across the temple's width, and it was 15 feet deep in front of the temple. He also made windows with beveled frames for the temple. He then built a chambered structure along the temple wall, encircling the walls of the temple, that is, the sanctuary and the inner sanctuary. And he made side chambers all the way around. The lowest chamber was seven and a half feet wide. The middle was nine feet wide, and the third was ten and a half feet wide. He also provided offset ledges for the temple all around the outside so that nothing would be inserted into the temple walls. The temple's construction used finished stones cut at the quarry so that no hammer, chisel, or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. The door for the lowest side chamber was on the right side of the temple. They went up a stairway to the middle chamber and from the middle to the third. When he finished building the temple, he paneled it with boards and planks of cedar. He built the chambers along the entire temple, joined to the temple with cedar beams. Each story was seven and a half feet high. And the word of the Lord came to Solomon. As for this temple you are building, he said, if you walk in my ways, observe my ordinances, and keep all my commandments by walking in them, I will fulfill my promise to you, which I made to your father David. I will dwell among the Israelites and not abandon my people Israel. <clears throat> so you look at that and almost think to yourself, well, wait a minute now. Israel was taken into captivity. Israel, was just, the temple was destroyed. There were some really bad things that happened throughout history to Jerusalem and to the nation. And, and here we have this, I will dwell among the Israelites and not abandon my people. And you look at the history of this nation and you would think, well, sure looks like God abandoned them to me. Sure looks like he got fed up with them to me. Looks like, almost like at times he gave up on them. But we're seeing nearsighted in that way. We're, we're not seeing the big picture further down the road. He will, uh, in the end, restore and we know that, the people. He will rebuild the temple, and his promises will be fulfilled. But notice the conditions, and these conditions were not met all the time. Walk in my statutes, observe my ordinances, and keep all of my commandments by doing them. James says, you know, don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. That's exactly what God's saying here to, to Solomon. Don't just be a hearer. Don't be someone going through the motions. Be a doer. Walk in my statutes. Live your life in the way that I've laid out for you to have a good life. Observe my ordinances. Keep Passover, keep the feasts, keep these things holy, and keep my commandments by walking in them, and I will fulfill my promise to you. Now, how does that translate into our lives? Today, when we say, well, I'm saved by grace. I'm not saved by my perfection and my works. I'm saved by God's grace and mercy. So maybe it doesn't really matter whether I'm walking in the statutes or not, because after all, it's all about grace. Right? It does matter. Jesus, you know, I love his logic. I love his simplicity when he says, can, can a fresh water string bring forth salt water? Can, uh, uh, can a fruit tree bring forth 
uh, thorns and, and thistles? Well, no, obviously not. You can sit there and say, I'm a peach tree all you want. But if you don't have any peaches and all you've got is thorn and thistles, then you're lying to yourself and you're lying to other people. You're deceiving yourself. And so, you know, a good tree is known by its fruit. I love that. That's, it's just pure logic. A good tree isn't known by how beautiful it is or majestic it is. It's known by its fruit. We were um, at the mission Sunday night. I was at the mission, and it was awesome. There was at least 150 guys in there. The um, place was packed with all men. I didn't see one female in there. And we were talking about trees. And I was sharing with them how when I first moved up here to Oregon, how fascinated I was with the majestic 150 foot tall fir trees everywhere that are growing, these massive trees. And I always thought, wow, that's so be- they're so beautiful, you know. Uh, but then when you see the wind blow and the trouble times come and they get knocked over. And you go out in the forest and you look at them and you think, that 100-foot tree only had a clump about this big around of root. No wonder it got blown over. Now, if those roots would have went into the ground 50 feet, they'd still be standing. So from the outside, I would look at them and I would go, majestic, they could never topple over, they're awesome, right? Well, not so, not true. From outside appearances, it looked that way, but their root was shallow. Whereas, coming from Arizona, go out in the desert and find a mesquite tree. They're not pretty. They're ugly, actually. They're weathered. They're beat down. Their branches are all crooked. The wood's really, really hard. But they can survive anything. Because a mesquite tree root can go up to 90 feet down into the ground. 90 feet. Now, when you got a root 90 feet down in the ground, you're not going to ever have to worry about toppling over. Life lesson, exactly. So, from the outside, it might look great, but if it doesn't have root, if it's not grounded, then it's going to be at risk of blowing over. Whereas this not-so-attractive tree that literally goes down 90 feet into the ground, it's virtually indestructible. And so thinking about that whole lesson right there and thinking about what God is telling uh, David or Solomon here, um, by walking in my statutes, by observing my ordinances, by keeping my commandments and living them, your roots are going to go deep. You're not going to be a clump. You're going to have deep roots and nothing can move you. But, you know, if we, as Christians, don't have our roots deep, and we're living in a time right now where you better have your roots deep. Because if you don't, you're going to get blown away. If you don't, you're going to give up. You're going to fail. And there's a lot of Christians out there that all they've got is a clump. they got no depth. They're soft. They're spoiled. They're shallow. They're very self-centered. They don't really understand what it means to sink your roots deep into the soil so that you cannot be moved no matter what comes. Very important thing, I think, that we can take away uh, from that. Um, In verse 8, it's kind of interesting. I was reading one of the other versions, and it said that this stairway here that went um, up to the second floor and then up to the third floor was spiral stairwell. It was in a spiral as it went up, which is kind of a cool thing. Think about the architecture that it took to, to uh, put this together. And we're going to see more and more of the, 
amazing genius in, in building this thing. Uh, where did I leave off? I'm at 14, thank you. When Solomon finished building the temple, he paneled the interior temple walls with cedar boards. From the temple floor to the surface of the ceiling, he overlaid the interior with wood. He also overlaid the floor with cypress boards. Or I suppose fir would be what it, what it is. He also overlaid the floor. Uh, oh, and then he lined 30 feet of the rear of the temple with cedar boards from the floor to the surface of the ceiling. He built the interior as an inner sanctuary, the most holy place. The temple, that is, the sanctuary in front of the most holy place, was 60 feet long. The cedar paneling inside the temple was carved, I love this, with ornamental gourds and flower blossoms. Everything was cedar. Not a stone could be seen. That's amazing. That's why it burned up so easy. There's a lot of good wood used to build this thing. He prepared the inner sanctuary inside the temple to put the Ark of the Lord's Covenant there. We know that as the Holy of Holies. The interior of the sanctuary was 30 feet long, 30 feet wide, 30 feet high. He overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid the cedar altar. Next, Solomon overlaid the interior of the temple with pure gold. And he hung gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. And so he added the gold overlay to the entire temple until everything was completely finished, including the entire altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary. What a place that must have been, huh? Beautiful. The inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim, 15 feet high, out of olive wood. One wing of the first cherub was seven and a half feet long, and the other wing was seven and a half feet long. The wingspan was 15 feet from tip to tip. The second cherub also was 15 feet. Both cherub had the same size and shape. The first cherub's height was 15 feet, and so was the second cherub's. And then he put the cherubim inside the inner temple. Since their wings were spread out, the first one's wings touched one wall, while the second cherub's wings touched the other wall. And in the middle of the temple, their wings were touching, wing to wing. He also overlaid the cherubim with gold. Wow. Trying to picture that, you know, 15 feet tall. That's really amazing. When we think of the cherub, I think we're automatically our mind goes to the Ark of the Covenant where there's those two cherubim on the top of it on the mercy seat there. Much, much smaller in scale, of course, than, than what we're looking at here. But can you imagine walking in this building into the, that, that outer court there, the inner court rather, where the first thing you see is these two giant gold cherubs uh, with each wing touching each wall. Verse 29, he carved all the surrounding temple walls uh, with carved engravings. Uh, little cherubim. Little, little, now I don't know, some of these places you go to today, some of these gothic kind of looking places you go to, they have these little cherubim that look like fat babies, right? And you look at me and go, that doesn't look very scary to me, little chubby little baby with a couple wings. I tend to think that maybe these weren't chubby little babies, um, <laughs> but you know these little cherubim who have been literally carved into the wood along with palm trees and flower blossoms what kind of artistic talent did they have in the nation in the inner and outer sanctuary he overlaid the temple floor 
with gold in both the inner and the outer sanctuary. For the entrance of the inner sanctuary, he made olive wood doors. The pillars of the doorposts were five-sided. The two doors were made of olive wood. He carved cherubim and palm trees and flower blossoms on them and overlaid them with gold. Hammering gold over the cherubim and the palm trees. In the same way, he made four-sided olive wood doorposts for the sanctuary entrance. The two doors were made of cypress wood. The first door had two folding sides and the second door had two folding panels. He carved cherubim, palm trees, and flower blossoms on them and overlaid them with gold, applied evenly over the carving. He built the inner courtyard with three rows of dressed stone and a row of trimmed cedar beams. The foundation of the Lord's temple was laid in Solomon's fourth year in the month of Ziv. In his eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the temple was completed in every detail and according to every specification. So he built it in seven years, which is pretty incredible. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of work that they got done in a seven-year period. Now, on the other hand, you look at uh, Herod's temple. When Jesus was walking through with the disciples and they were talking about how beautiful the buildings were and all that. And, and uh, Jesus say, destroy this temple and in three days I'll, I'll rebuild it. And of course he was talking about his uh, death and resurrection. But the Pharisees thought he was talking about the actual temple itself and they said, you're nuts. We've been building this thing 40 years. And it's still not done. Forty years. These guys did this one in seven. So kind of a big difference right there between the two. Um, so I don't know that. Uh, I don't know that we can even begin to imagine. Um, the majesty of this beautiful, beautiful building. I was looking at it thinking that maybe we could take some tips for remodeling our church. Huh? I'd like to see some palm trees and olive uh, carves and gold and yeah. So you can see how um, every time these temples were destroyed they were mainly destroyed because they wanted the, the gold. And uh, so when this temple was destroyed it was much the same but then when Herod's temple was destroyed and they set it on fire um, they didn't set it on fire just to destroy it they set it on fire to get the gold out of it to melt it and uh, you know scripture uh, history is pretty clear to tell us that it, you know it was Titus that did that and when they set it on fire and the gold started melting as it burnt and it melted down through all the stones it got filled up in all the little nooks and crannies of all these humongous stones. And so now what? We burned it down, but the gold's all stuck in these little cracks. So let's just push the stones over the edge of the Temple Mount and we can get to the gold that way, right? And people say, well, that's outrageous. How could they have done that? Well, if you go over there today, I think you can probably see that the stones that they pushed over the edge are still on the ground. They're still there. Another interesting little point here is that um, <coughs> in talking about the uh, construction of the stones and the, and the moving of the wood and all of those kinds of things, as I said earlier, each um, stone was marked. Each stone had a specific place that it was going to be put in. Now Paul, I think it's in Ephesians, talks about us being a spiritual building. 
much like the physical temple, God is building a temple, a building out of us, the church. Now, if each stone in the construction of this temple had a specific place, a specific purpose, a perfect spot, I would look at that and I would say, you know, as God is building this spiritual temple, we can say the same thing. Each person is placed in that perfect spot where God can best use them. Their talents, their desires, their, uh, you know, whatever their, their callings might be. Each one of us has this calling in our lives where we fit perfectly together. As and Paul calls it, a spiritual building. And that's, that's really what we are. Is Each of us is unique. Each stone was unique, but yet at the same time, each one fit perfectly with the others around it, which created this beautiful building. Well, God's building a building right now, but we call it the church, right? It's us. And uh, kind of a cool picture, uh, once again, in the Old Testament, pointing to the new, when Paul got him uses this as a way to um, teach the people you are each part of a very big building. You're each part of the, the temple construction, in a sense. Kind of a neat thing. Another little uh, tidbit before we go is that... Uh, they had a cornerstone. And again, each one was marked for its specific purpose and specific placement on the Temple Mount. But there was this one stone that was really special. It was called the cornerstone. And when they were doing inventory, we might see this later on, <coughs> they'd come across this cornerstone, which was different from all the rest. It looked different. It didn't fit in in their mind's eye. They thought, what is this stone here? Very weird. It must have been a manufacturer's blunder. It doesn't look like it fits any. Well, let's just get rid of it. So they threw it off the side. They didn't know what it was for until they got to the point where they had all this stuff going on in the capstone was missing the cornerstone was missing and they start looking through all the rubble and they come to that stone that they had rejected that the builders rejected and come to find out that was the most important stone in the whole building and they retrieved it and they brought it back up to oh boy we almost blew it right so that whole thing that whole action that took place there was later referred to as Christ. He's the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. He was rejected by the builders, if you will, the leaders of Israel, but yet he has become the chief cornerstone. So everything that we're looking at here has a lot of significance to it. It has a lot of meaning uh, to what God's plan would be in the future. The whole building is almost like a prophetic building as it's being put together. It's pointing to the future. And uh, so kind of a cool thing, huh? Kind of a neat thing. Um, there are so many cool stories that aren't necessarily in here about the construction of this building and some of the things that went on. When you get to um, Nehemiah, when Israel is coming back from Babylon and the temple is in ruins and they've got to rebuild everything, then that second temple is being rebuilt when they're coming back. And again, you, you get to see the depth of construction and the work that went in to just rebuilding it. Now, yeah, the temple was tore down, but you know, the foundation was still there. That's the same foundation that was originally laid. It never was destroyed. That foundation's sure. 
So you've had three temples put in the same spot on the same foundation. So interesting little tidbits there, right? So we're going to stop there. We're going to park right there. I think it's a good place to stop, right? Yes, we finished chapter 6. So we'll call that a good spot, and we'll pick it up next week when we get back together again. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for this awesome record of this construction of this building uh, that you allowed your spirit to dwell in. And it's just really exciting tonight to know that we are that spiritual building, that your spirit dwells within us, that we are the temple now, that we are the ones who testify of who you are. We are the witnesses for the Messiah, and we thank you for that, Lord. Uh, Bless us as we go tonight. Keep us safe, Lord. Keep us with our mind fixed upon you. Pray for us, Lord, that we don't allow the things of the world, the troubles that we see around us, to debilitate us and weaken us, but help us to be rest assured that you are in full control, that you know exactly what you're doing. We have nothing to fear, and we thank you so much for that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.